today on January the 28th. Uh, good afternoon, good morning, good evening, wherever you are today. Uh, thank you all for coming. Uh, this is likely to be our biggest Haystack Live meetup um, we've ever had. Um, I think we have uh, 244 people signed up, which is quite impressive. Thank you to everyone who's joining us for the first time. My name's Charlie Hull. Um, I'm a managing consultant at Open Source Connections. We're a firm that specializes in helping people with uh, empower their teams to build the best search engines with open source software. Uh, we specialize in Elasticsearch and Solar mainly. And we run the Haystack conference series. And this meetup originally started uh, because we had to cancel our physical conference this uh, last year for obvious reasons, and a chance for everyone to still hear the marvelous talks we'd have set up. Um, I've got a, there's a couple of things on your screen there. There's um, some trainings we do, so do check those out. But I'll now get rid of that. We are recording the meetup to uh, YouTube, so we'll have a chance to review it later and uh, get a chance to, to um, hear from our marvelous speakers. So the subject today um, is the great search engine debate. It's the most common uh, question that brings people to our website at OSC, which is Elasticsearch versus Solar. Solar versus Elasticsearch. Should I use Elasticsearch or Solar? And it's the sort of question that if you work in the search business, you get quite used to. But we're also gonna throw another one into the mix, um, a new but also old, uh, older search engine, uh, which is also open source, um, Vespa. So we've lined up three fantastic speakers for you today, and they're gonna start with giving a quick pitch to support the engine, their, uh, their favorite engine. Uh, although I think I'd, I'll, I'll also speak to them to say they also see the advantages of all the others. Um, and then we're going to open up the floor for questions and you'll get a chance to ask those burning questions you have about uh, any of the three contenders today. Now, the way we're going to work this is uh, our speakers will give their pitch. Uh, as you'll see, some of them have got their video and uh, audio ready. And then after the three pitches, uh, please submit your questions using the chat on Zoom. Um, if you could please avoid typing other things into there, because I may have a lot of questions to get on top of. I will then moderate and ask questions to our speakers in turn or whoever seems appropriate at the time. Um, now, the last point is you may have noticed there's been a little news about Elastic and Elasticsearch over the last couple of weeks. Um, so just to make sure we do talk about um, more than one subject today, I'm going, probably going to limit any questions around that subject. And uh, particularly, I see, I see poor Josh from Elastic is looking slightly relieved at that news, uh, just to make sure we cover as many aspects as possible. But those burning questions you've got about Solar, Elasticsearch or Vespa, uh, you've got a chance to answer those today. So um, I'm just going to introduce our speakers uh, very briefly today. So firstly, we have, uh, in no particular order, we have Josh Devins. Uh, Josh uh, started at uh, SoundCloud with Search and now works for Elastic. Um, he's based in uh, Germany, I believe, and uh, he is a senior principal engineer and working in the area of machine learning. And he'll be talking about Elasticsearch today. Uh, Anshan Gupta uh, has worked for Lucidworks, uh, IBM on the Watson Search Project and is currently at Apple where he is a, a search engineer. Um, and he is also uh, an Apache Lucene Solar Committer. Uh, he's part of the uh, Project Management Committee, the PMC at uh, Lucene Solar. And I think he's now the, the uh, the, yes, he's the Vice President of Apache Lucene. So he'll be talking about solar today. And last but certainly not least, we have Joe Christian Bergen, um, who's based out of Norway, works for Ver Verizon Media, and also uh, worked on the uh, Fast ESP project um, back in the day. And he's going to be talking about Vespa. He's a Senior Principal Software Engineer at Verizon Media, and he'll be talking about Vespa. So I'm now going to uh, shut up and let people who know far more than me take over. And I'm going to start uh, again uh, in purely a random order. I, Anshan, would you like to, to kick us off with your little pitch about solar? Sure. Uh, thanks for the introduction, Charlie. Uh, and it's, uh, I'm glad to be here today. Um, uh, as Charlie already mentioned, uh, I've been involved with the Apache Lucene Solar Project uh, for a reasonably long time. I'm going to start off with a little bit of history of uh, where the project comes from, how it evolved, uh, talk about the key features, not necessarily including everything under the sun, uh, and then move on to 
what the future holds and uh, how things look like for the project. Uh, uh, again, as, as Charlie already mentioned, in my, in my personal opinion, I feel technically speaking, uh, at least as far as Elastic and Solar go, I believe that both of them can interchangeably do each other's job for the most part, uh, if not for everything. Uh, people tend to choose one over the other based on their specific use cases, uh, and that's the right way to go. Um, so without wasting any more time, uh, I'm going to start off with the history. So solar, uh, for people who don't know, uh, was developed uh, a long time ago, back in 2004 at CNET as an in-house project to solve their search problems. Um, and then a couple of years later, uh, in 2006, it was donated uh, to the Apache Software Foundation um, and came under the ASF umbrella uh, back in the day. Uh, and then uh, once the project uh, was introduced to, or we came under the Apache umbrella, uh, uh, there was a realization that most people working on the solar project were also contributing to uh, were Lucene committers. Uh, solar was based on off on Lucene and they kind of relied on each other uh, and, and there were issues around duplicated code uh, or trying to keep both projects in sync. So a decision was made by, by both the projects to merge or combine both of them and for Solar to become uh, a sub-module, uh, so to say, of Apache Lucene back in 2010. Um, moving out of the current state, and it's been a long, uh, long journey since then, um, the project has evolved into a rather mature, uh, scalable uh, search, search engine. And uh, uh, just the just sheer user and use case diversity uh, uh, speaks volumes in terms of uh, how widely used Solar is and the kind of features that uh, that Solar supports. And I believe that the most important reason as to why that happened is is basically the thriving community uh, around the project itself that that allowed for the project to evolve over time, uh, starting from uh, you know. Uh, a basic full text search engine based on Lucene, um, adding advanced full text search capabilities, uh, and then adding support for search like uh, search over geospatial data, craft search, uh, and then uh, further transforming into, um, into things like analytics and uh, learning to rank uh, and, and much, much more. Uh, also, uh, introduction of Solar Cloud uh, back in 2013, I believe, uh, that allowed for Solar to basically behave uh, as a distributed system and allowed people to scale their their setup um, and and be able to provide search over vast amount of data traffic that was kind of becoming usual for the time uh, back in the day. Um, an important aspect or an important thing that, that Solar offers that in my opinion is a key fee, key reason why people tend to choose Solar over other projects is, is the extensible plugin architecture that Solar, uh, uh, Solar comes with. Uh, the way Solar has been built ever from the start is, uh, is the idea of having, having a basic core project and then being able, allowing users to, uh, to write custom code uh, plugins uh, and to use them uh, in whatever way their business need requires them to use uh, use the project, um, and that allows them to not only develop stuff in house but also continue to contribute stuff back upstream. Uh, as as people tend to believe uh, that that the specific plugin might be of use to other people, and that kind of adds on to the community side of things as well as adding on to the features. Um, and the more the more the users for a specific feature, in my opinion, the better tested the project ends up being, both on the stability front, the performance front, as well as the security front of things. Um, and over the last 10 years, the project based on them, that model ended up almost like a kitchen sink. So right now, I don't believe there are a lot of things that, that, that sort of doesn't offer that 99% of the use cases for search uh, are, are generally trying to aim for. Um, and the future for solar kind of is, uh, is even more interesting. While there's active feature work that's continuing to happen, um, a, a lot of interesting things have happened in the past. Uh, the streaming aggregations, the, um, the math expressions, all of the library around analytics that solar introduced uh, with the upcoming release, there's gonna be a visual math uh, reference guide uh, 
attached or a part of the official reference guide that Solar releases with each of its releases. Uh, that makes it easier to use Solar as an analytics engine, uh, not just a search engine anymore. Um, more recently, we also got a grant from, uh, from Bloomberg uh, for the Solar Operator, uh, which allows people to run Solar in Kubernetes without having to deal with a ton of operational issues or, or having to write their own orchestration uh, stuff around running Kubernetes, uh, uh, Solar on Kubernetes themselves. Um, and while that has been offered by Bloomberg in the past for a reasonably long time, and there've been uh, a ton of users uh, who've relied on that, uh, what's also uh, happened with this migration is this now becomes an official uh, Apache offering that is going to move uh, together with the releases that, uh, that Solar, uh, uh, the release cadence that kind of uh, comes with Solar. And, uh, uh, as I mentioned, about 10 years ago, uh, a decision was made uh, by Lucene and Solar Committers to combine both these projects. These projects have now been, uh, and back in the day, there was a need to do so. Um, and over the last 10 years, the way both of these projects are handled, or modules are handled, are different. One of them being a Java library, the other one being an application uh, extendable and something that you could run out of the box. Uh, and so uh, in a recent vote, or not so recent vote, uh, a decision was made to separate out Apache Solar as its own top level project. So it's still going to be an Apache project. Most of the people working on these projects are gonna be overlapping, but it's gonna spin off into its own separate project. Um, and uh, more importantly, just to reiterate, um, uh, all of this ties into the Apache way uh, of doing things that kind of motivates uh, a lot of uh, users or should motivate a lot of users to go ahead and use Solar as, uh, as their search solution of choice. That's all I heard from my end. Fantastic. Thank you, Anshan. So that's one perspective on Solar, an Apache licensed project and which has been around for a long time. Uh, another project that ha has been around for probably longer than you think uh, is Vespa from the uh, um, Oath Yahoo Verizon stable. So I'm gonna ask our next speaker, Joe Christian, to give his pitch for Vespa. Yeah, so thank you, Charlie. And uh, thank you for inviting me. And also for hosting this very interesting discussion. And it's so great to see so many people here today. So I work on the Vespa team uh, in various media. And uh, you asked me, Charlie, earlier on the email uh, if I wanted to pitch uh, Vespa uh, for modern search. And I love the term modern search. And first, when I talk about search applications, I mean the type of applications where an end user is actually typing a search query. So in that context, there are two primary reasons why Vespa is the right choice for building a modern search application. One thing is that Vespa supports a wide range of modern retri retrieval and ranking models. And the other thing is that Vespa supports true real-time indexing and true partial updates. But before diving into these two topics, I would like to talk about what Vespa is. And Vespa is the ultimate ultimate data serving platform, big data serving platform. Uh, because it's not only a powerful search engine, but it's also used for a variety of real time serving use cases. That said, search and recommendation are by far the two most common use cases. So the team here in Trondheim, Norway, developing Vespa has been working on search and ranking at scale for more than 20 years. And Vespa is a battle proven platform which has been used at scale for 17 years across Yahoo, now various in media. We open sourced Vespa in 2017 under the Apache 2.0 license. And since then, many companies have started using it. So back to the reasons why Vespa is the best choice for building a modern search. The first reason is that Vespa supports a wide range of modern retrieval and ranking models. Vespa has by far the largest toolbox for building a truly modern search application. Surely Vespa can do simple term matching and ranking using BM25, for example, as a starting point, but the toolbox for improving search and ranking is really large in Vespa. Vespa handles both structured and unstructured data. Vectors or tensors in general are first-class citizens in the Vespa document model. 
tensors are used in queries, in documents, and at ranking evaluation using functions over tensors. VESPA also supports approximate nearest neighbor search in the dense vector space, which can be used for many different modern retrieval use cases, not only for text, but also for multimedia, but also using a combination of different features and mapping them into the same embedding space where the nearest neighbor search can be used as a very effective retrieval function. The approximate nearest neighbor search operator in VESPA is unique. It's unique in the industry at large since it can be combined using with, with regular query terms or filters. Also, VESPA supports multi-phase retrieval and ranking and the developer has explicit control over how documents are ranked by using VESPA's ranking language. Developers can write their own ranking expressions or they can use machine learning to generate the ranking expressions. And speaking of machine learning and machine learning ranking or learning to rank, VESPA integrates with a wide range of popular machine learning libraries. For example, TensorFlow, PyTorch, XGBoost, LightGBM, and this also allows us to import ONX models. VESPA also integrates and uses ONX runtime to speed up the inference of matching documents and the models are, sorry, <laughs> speed up inference of matching documents. The models are applied distributed and in parallel over the content nodes. And this allows scaling machine learning model inference without having to use other machine model services for specific computation. Our machine learning integration deep into our content nodes also enables running ensemble models where you can use the output of different models to produce the final inference score. Finally, on this topic on modern search, I would like to say that we are actually uh, living through a paradigm shift. Pre-trained language models like BERT have really transformed search and improved the state of the art significantly since 2019. And VESPA allows you to rank documents using pre-trained language models like BERT. Moving to the second reason, and the second reason why VESPA is the best choice for a modern search is that VESPA has a really true real-time indexing capability and also handles evolving data sets. Real-time indexing latency in VESPA is really measured in milliseconds and not seconds, as VESPA uses a hybrid combination of true mutable in-memory data structures with immutable indexes on disk. The VESPA content node layer is written in C++ and handles large amounts of data in memory per node without memory management problems. VESPA also supports true partial updates of searchable fields of documents at scale with high throughput. And this is especially a useful feature for updating fields like, for example, the in-stock status in an e-commerce search setting, or updating a tensor field with real-time click feedback, which can be used for ranking in search and recommendation use cases. VESPA also has true elastic content clusters. There's no need to upfront determine the number of shards. As you grow your data volume, you just add nodes and VESPA will take care of automatically redistribute the data and rebalance the data without a noticeable serving impact. So to summarize my pitch, the two primary reasons why VESPA is the best choice for building a true modern search application is that VESPA supports a wide range of modern retrieval and ranking techniques. And also it supports true real-time indexing and true partial updates. So thank you very much. That was my pitch. And I'm really looking forward to your questions on Vespa. And I'm super excited to be here. And I will try to answer your questions as good as possible. Thank you. <laughs> Joe Christian, thank you so much. So um, we now have our, our next contender. Um, Josh, do you want to give us uh, the lowdown on Elastic? I can't Search believe you made me go last, Charlie. <laughs> I'm sorry. I'm sorry, it was purely a random selection. I understand. Who I introduced first, who go last. Uh, thanks, Charlie. Appreciate uh, having the opportunity to uh, represent Elastic and Elasticsearch here. Um, so I'm gonna, I'm just gonna dive in and uh, talk about, you know, what do I see as uh, the main benefits of Elasticsearch? Um, why should you take Elasticsearch uh, as a strong consent contender for your project? And I think the the big, I, I have kind of some, let's say buckets that I put the, 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 uh, the points in. And I think the first one for me is really the ecosystem. So Elasticsearch has arguably, I would argue, the largest worldwide community uh, of search users. 
um, there's a huge, huge variety of people uh, talking about using Elasticsearch, writing about their experiences in, in many languages as well. So uh, from forums, uh, tons of blogs, uh, books, um, you will find uh, a large uh, peer support network uh, in Elasticsearch. Um, not only in terms of like how do you how do you use Elasticsearch, what are you what are you doing with uh, Elasticsearch, but also of course like Solar, we have uh, a third party uh, plugin ecosystem, uh, and it's it's quite uh, it, it's quite an important part of of our overall ecosystem because we also recognize that you know, we can't build everything into Elasticsearch that uh, you can imagine, and uh, community members have built, uh, for example, just the first thing off the top of my mind is the learning to rank plugin. Thank you, Open Source Connections, uh, a rather popular plugin. Um, we have all, we have also uh, Open uh, Open NLP plugin for uh, uh, natural language processing, uh, and there's recently also been an approximate nearest neighbors um, plugin, the KNN plugin, uh, for doing uh, exact and approximate nearest neighbors search on dense vectors. So you you know you could see that the the community because of its size, you know, there's going to be someone in that community that has a problem similar to yours. Uh, and they're either building plugins, they're talking about it. And I think that's a big part of, of Elasticsearch is you can go into a project and know that you're not alone. There's probably someone that's already done this uh, and you can, find, uh, you can find somebody to help. And uh, I think uh, a part of the ecosystem also has to do with a notion of like hireability. So if you're in a search team, you know, one of the hardest things to do is scale up a search team. So you need to find uh, other engineers that are already on board, they already know Elasticsearch, they have experience with Elasticsearch, or you can hire a good smart engineer that can onboard very quickly uh, onto Elasticsearch based on the, the community um, that we have. So I think that this sort of community aspect is an extremely important one for us. I would add to that sort of uh, to accompany that, that there's a professional backing. So if you can't find the, the support or you need uh, quicker support than what you can get from the community, uh, you can come to Elastic uh, for uh, support, for bug reports, bug fixing, uh, training, consulting. And what's also great about our community is that we have, uh, for example, other third parties, let's say uh, Open Source Connections, who also do training uh, on Elasticsearch, uh, which, is, you know, which is also great for the, for the whole community. Um, I think maybe somehow related to ecosystem is uh, we have an extremely fast pace of development. So when you do see major security issues or um, really blocking bugs, uh, we are able to get to them. We will accept you know, pull requests and, and changes um, to, to fix issues. And we have minor releases about every eight weeks for our entire uh, product stack, including Elasticsearch. So you can rely on extremely regular uh, progress and regular updates. And um, on the more technical side, um, we're Lucene at the core. So, you know, I'm going to, I'm going to side with Ansham on, on this one, you know, Lucene has, has 20 years of, of, you know, really solid engineering experience behind it. Um, and we also have uh, experts in Elasticsearch that are contributing back to Lucene on a very regular basis. So you have deep expertise um, in Lucene when, when you go with Elasticsearch as well. So I think I saw in 2020, the top uh, five contributors to Lucene, three of them were from, Elastic, uh, from Elastic and working on Elasticsearch. So uh, there's some security, let's say, in, in knowing that we know, you know all the way down the stack, uh, we can also you know, certainly make, make contributions that uh, Solik can, can uh, benefit from as well. And that's part of the community that we want, uh, we want to be involved in. Um, again, on the more technical side, uh, scale is usually one of the things that people talk about um, with Elasticsearch. And uh, scale was really one of the one of the, the primary things that was was thought of from really from day one. So this was a, a, a search product that was designed from day one for a cluster, either on prem or in cloud. You know, this was never meant to run, uh, although it can. Uh, it's never really meant to run in production on a single node. We were designed from day one uh, to be distributed. Um, scale uh, in terms of uh, scale up and scale out. Um, you know, a lot of people are not only interested in scaling out, but scaling up. Uh, they want to be able to throw resources uh, at search and for uh, Elasticsearch can take full advantage of everything uh, that you throw at it, whether it's getting bigger nodes or, you know, scaling from your laptop for easy development and debugging to the cloud from one node to 100 nodes. 
this was really the, the ground up. This is how Elasticsearch started and this is how it's, it's designed um, from its foundation. Um, I'll mention real-time capabilities as well. Um, it's, uh, it was also designed as a real-time engine. Uh, we're not interested in static indices. Uh, we know that the requirements of use cases are often about keeping documents up to date. Um, and we can handle multiple different types of workloads, whether you're a read heavy workload, you wanna optimize for reads or you're a write heavy workload and wanna optimize for writes, or you have some balance that you need to strike between uh, read and write workloads. Uh, Elasticsearch is able to be uh, configured rather easily um, to support lots of different types of workloads. Um, maybe not so much on the hard technical side, but uh, we have a very comprehensive uh, set of very well-documented APIs. And that's HTTP and JSON for everything, super simple, easy to understand, you know, standards that apply across all of our APIs, including administration. So when you get used to using the APIs, you can go and, and administer uh, Elasticsearch in exactly the same way. Uh, and of course, when you're designing uh, your search queries, we have a very full featured uh, query DSL allowing you to express very simple queries all the way through to extremely detailed uh, and complex requirements for your queries. Um, so this, I think this, this really speaks as well to this idea that Elasticsearch can be as basic as you want it to be uh, or as advanced as you want it to be. And we grow with you, whether it's uh, in terms of scale, whether it's uh, ramping up, um, you know, working on your single machine, like we'll go with you the whole journey um, uh, uh, throughout your search product. Um, I think the last one that, that really stands out to me is uh, operations. So Elasticsearch is, is well known to be not only easy to scale, easy to, to get started for engineers, but rather easy to deploy, whether it's on uh, Kubernetes cluster, which we also already have uh, support for deploying uh, Elasticsearch on Kubernetes, uh, to managing it uh, and observing it, whether you choose to use our products or other products for observation. Um, we know that this is an essential part of uh, uh, running uh, a search engine is being able to observe everything that's happening. Um, of course, the other side is being able to do easy backups and restores. We have snapshots uh, as a capability to extremely uh, quickly uh, reload from a snapshot, whether it's for uh, doing some kind of offline testing or uh, you want production data to do some development work on uh, or really restoring in, in the case of a critical failure, uh, snapshots are there for you. Um, I think the last one that I would point out is sort of this idea of cloudiness. That again, when, when Elasticsearch was, was started, the, the cloud was starting to be a, a big deal. And so again, from day one, it was known that Elasticsearch will run in the cloud and that was the target. So um, we have great features like uh, availability zone awareness. So um, you, will, you always have highly available data. You'll know, you, know you, can, you can tell Elasticsearch that you wanna run in two or three availability zones and we'll distribute data around the cluster with knowledge that um, you would, you know, you need to be uh, highly available through uh, availability zones. Um, and we also support um, through, uh, for snapshots, we also support all of the common object stores like Google Cloud Storage, AWS three, AWS S3. So if you wanna spin up a cluster in another part of the world um, or a development cluster or anything like that, it's super easy to do it um, using snapshots in any of your favorite clouds. Uh, that's, I think that's kind of it for me and I'm, excited to, to get it, to dig into the details with everyone. Fantastic, thank you, Josh. Um, right, well, there we go. We've got three different search engines, uh, pros and cons of each. Uh, what do you think? Do you have a question around this comparison? Do you have a question about a particular engine, whether it does something better or worse than another engine, whether it can cope with your use case? We've got three experts in the room, so please do type your questions into the chat and uh, I will then decide who to ask. So I'm gonna try and keep this even. Um, so please, um, let's try and get a spread of questions to all our participants here, all our experts. So, and we're already kicking off. Uh, please bear in mind, there's a lot of people in the room. We may not get to your question. And if I haven't chosen your question, uh, it's just simply probably because I haven't got to it. Okay. Um, Right, we've got a first question. Um, I'm gonna, I, I, I'm just gonna say your handle because I don't know your actual name. A Moren. Um, 
I'm going to ask uh, all the participants to give us a few word, uh, words. Um, you've got an index with text for search, but you've also you've got some dozen, a couple of dozen features you want to use in learning to rank. I want to update two of the dozen features across several billion documents because I changed my feature extraction. How does the engine deal with this? So the first person I'm going to ask, because he's smiling, is Joe Christian. Uh, can you give us a, a short answer to this one? Yeah, so this um, this use case is very common inside various media. Um, so and that's why we have what I call true partial update support, where you don't have to update the document. You don't need to read the document and then re-index the document. You actually can update the document and the value in place. So, for example, for a single integer or a float, uh, we can update roughly like 50,000 updates per second per node. Uh, so we do this, yes, at, at scale in real time in, in various and, and with Vespa. So that's totally a supported use case uh, in Vespa. And, and the learning to rank framework uh, and the features on your model, they will immediately see those updated uh, values. So, yeah. Fantastic. Ansham, how would you do this with Solar? Honestly, uh, I would have to skip this question. Uh, I haven't dealt a ton with learning to rank module of solar. Uh, so I'm going to skip this and not claim I need, I know the answer to this one. That's, that's very fine of you. Always best to, best to admit when you don't know something. Um, Josh, what do you think? So I think, I mean, I would tag team with an expert on the LTR plugin from OSC. Um, but this, you know, for us, this would be uh, a matter of uh, also updating updating the fields in your index. Um, you know, this strikes me as well as um, we we often see people with Elasticsearch architectures where um, they find actually that that this type of use case is actually better supported by doing uh, re-ranking outside of the engine. So by having your data close to where you're doing re-ranking can actually be much more efficient than saying I want to go and update is it billions, billions of documents. Um, it, you may be better off to have actually a separate uh, re-ranking service and using Elasticsearch, for example, to generate candidates, you can do a, a three-phase ranking even where you can use LTR or a you know, slightly more expensive ranking function in Elasticsearch, um, but do then the, the heavy, heavy lifting where if you have real-time data, for example, uh, you may not want to do that uh, in the search engine. And, uh, you know, for us, that, that's fine. We're, we're okay with that. We, you don't need to solve all your problems in Elasticsearch. Um, but this may, this may be another, uh, like an alternative, I would say. You, you can do it where you update every document um, in Elasticsearch. We may not have quite the same throughput that you'd get with Vespa, but I, I think you'd find that it would be um, fairly close, a assuming you've done all the other uh, retraining, uh, retraining of your model with evaluation and everything outside. Fantastic. Okay, so just to, to, we, we we skipped solar on this one. Um, I'm just going to very quickly. Is Alex Benedetti in the room? If you are, just unmute and say hello. I thought you'd be able to answer this one for solar, but it seems not. Okay, never mind. Um, moving on. Um, so I've got another one for Joe Christian. Um, Chris Marino says uh, that. Uh, popularity with Elasticsearch and Solar, they're very approachable technologies. It's simple for a beginner to get started indexing or searching. Um, and his impression is that the technical entry level for Vespa is much more advanced. Would you agree or disagree? How would you recommend starting out with Vespa? Uh, it's a great question. And uh, since we've been closed source, uh, we watched Elastic and we saw they basically gain a lot of popularity from developer friendliness. And so I think we learn a lot from actually Elastic making it very easy to go from a single load deployment on your laptop and into a cloud deployment. So we basically, um, that's what we also try to do. So you can use Docker to run Vespa on your laptop and a Vespa application is described by um, an application package. And you can take that application and also deploy to our cloud offering or uh, to scale out the application package and the API um, it's the same if you have 100 nodes or if you have a single node. So I personally think that um, I think it's as easy to set up Vespa. There are two more steps uh, involving uh, setting up Vespa. So I, I think we are like 80% of the ease of use of Elastic from, on a single node. Okay. Thank you. 
So um, I'm going to move on to a, a, a different question here, which is a, an interesting philosophical one. Um, Ansham, do you want to cover this one? Uh, Michael Upshall asks, if elastic and solar have such similar functionality, why do they both exist? Yeah, yeah sure. I could take that. Uh, solar, uh, solar is an older engine. It's been around uh, longer to begin with. Um, when elastic surge, in my opinion, started, uh, solar was starting up and wasn't really mature in terms of being able to provide search over a distributed data set uh, to be able to scale um, across machines um, in a rather non-traditional, more modern manner with things like automatic leader election, uh, being able to split a shard, distribute your, your data across multiple shards and stuff like that. Um, and so it started off at that with different ideologies around what was more important to achieve and the approach uh, with respect to the implementation itself as well. Uh, but over the past, uh, both them evolved into different, different engines, uh, one kind of uh, more organized because it's kind of, uh, kind of driven by, by a company uh, with a roadmap, whereas the other one being an Apache uh, project, which is completely driven by its users. Uh, so that's why the, the feature sets are pretty much the same but for people who want to go ahead and use an Apache offer project, they end up using this and have the ability to either contribute back or, uh, or add to it. Um, so in my opinion, it's, it's just, uh, they started off as uh, separately only because there were different ideologies, different implementation details, and also there was no existing system that, that provided distributed search on top of the scene back in the day. Can I ask a clarifying question? <laughs> what, yeah. To add some, what do you think is, can you elaborate on the, dif on the differing ideologies fr from your um, perspective? Yeah, sure. Um, so Elasticsearch was started off as pure idea of um, a set of APIs, uh, uh, an engine that kind of was scale first, right? Distributed first uh, in terms of let's make it easy for people to use in terms of how do you set it up? How do you, how do you scale out? Whereas solar was coming from a mindset of we already have solar. How do you make it work in a manner where you, you can scale? It wasn't about how do you make it easy to scale? It was more about we have a search engine. How can we make it work in a as a distributed system uh, while still piggybacking on all the existing stuff that we already have? And so if you look at old APIs that solar, uh, if anyone uh, was a solar user 10 years ago or eight years ago, you would remember like the entire idea of having to bootstrap your solar cluster with Zookeeper and do a ton of things around it uh, kind of highlights the differences between when Elasticsearch came up, the idea was let's make it easy for users to be able to spin up a cluster, be able to scale up and scale out. Uh, things have changed over the past, but uh, by now they're two strong contenders uh, standing you know, head to head with each other uh, with very similar uh, feature set offering. And does, does that answer your question? Uh, yeah, yeah, it does. Charlie, okay. do you mind if I take the other half of the question, I guess? Yes, quickly, yeah. <laughs> so I guess from my perspective, I, I mean, I guess it's similar, uh, maybe looking at it from a different, a different lens, but um, uh, you know, I have a lot of respect for, for the team that, that started Elasticsearch. Um, they identified at the right time, they're in the right place at the right time with the right technology. They saw the need for, uh, for scale, for the cloud, for um, real-time workloads. Uh, and I think they capitalized on it extremely, extremely well. Uh, I think it was also clear, and this is always a big thing that Shai still talks about, is like, developers first, like really has to be extremely easy to get started, easy to use. Um, this is a key tenant. This is things that we still talk about um, within the company. Uh, and I think, you know, hopefully that's still the case for us is that you, know, you should be able to get started extremely easily. Configuration out of the box from Elasticsearch should work, like it should just work. Uh, and it should be, you know, really easy to scale up, uh, you know, as much as you want. So I'd say that we've stuck with that. And, uh, you know, I have, in terms of the question of like, why do they both exist? I, I think there was a gap in the marketplace um, and Elasticsearch fit that gap. Um, I'd, I'd also like to add, uh, there was the exi existence of the entire Elk stack that kind of motivated a ton of users early on to begin with at least, uh, to start using more of Elastic uh, and the lack of such a stack uh, um, 
easy to set up and and to use uh, was certainly one reason why uh, you know a ton of users also uh, start using Elastic uh, back in the day. Fantastic, thank you. We won't mention Banana then. Um, <laughs> uh, okay, so I've got a question for uh, Joe Christian. Um, from Suzanne, who says, uh, the support for non-English languages, uh, tokenizer, stemmers, etc. And uh, she's interested in, in German, Russian, Polish, Czech, and Hungarian. Now, uh, what is the support in, in VESPA for these languages? And if, if there isn't support, what's the, what would the effort to adapt some of the existing resources, perhaps from Solar or Open NLP, to make them work with VESPA? Yeah, so it's a, it's a great question. And uh, we integrate with uh, Open NLP. So whatever uh, languages that Open NLP supports for tokenization and stemming, VESPA also supports. Uh, it's actually very easy to uh, integrate a new linguistic libraries. I mean, already had a couple of contribution for CJK languages already uh, on that uh, because um, we have a lot of uh, both properties and, and uh, businesses using Vespa in, in CJK uh, languages. So, yeah, Fantastic. so it's possible to, to plug in, to extend, and, but we use uh, the Apache Open NLP as a default for, for, for text. Okay, so I think that answers your question, Suzanne. That Open NLP is already supported. Uh, hopefully that's a useful answer for you. Yeah. Um, so I'm going to move on to, to a more operational question. Uh, Deepak asks, uh, and I'd like a quick answer from all of you, which search engine is best for a write-heavy application? I and mean, in his experience, uh, Elasticsearch read performance is impacted when there are heavy writes. So, Josh, what do you think? Uh, sorry, what was the last bit? Read? Elasticsearch read performance is impacted when there are heavy writes. Yeah, yeah, sure. I mean, this is this is that trade-off of, of, you know, are you write heavy or read heavier somewhere in between? Uh, and and it's a trade-off. You know, you have to, you you do have to make some some choices. Um, I think Elasticsearch is perfectly capable of handling extremely high write loads. You know, and you see that with um, particularly the um, logging and analytics use cases where we stream in massive data sets uh, into Elasticsearch, and they must still be searchable. I, and I think the question is, you know, how? What are you expecting? Are you expecting? You know, read write performance uh, with no compromise. I, I don't think you're going to find that. Um, if you're looking for you know the highest read, uh, write uh, write uh, throughput as possible, you can get that. You can get extremely high write throughput um, with Elasticsearch, no problem. Uh, and we have lots of use cases supporting uh, showing this as well um, in our logging use cases. Fantastic, Ansham. What about uh, Solar? How did it cope in this situation? Uh, I believe uh, the high performance for Solar. Is, is pretty good so far. Uh, I'd like to specifically highlight the use case uh, that Bloomberg spoke about in one of the talks in the past uh, about their new search uh, problem where you have uh, thousands of input streams coming in, writing data uh, with, with uh, a sub second or 400 millisecond uh, commit interval, I think. Uh, so, and uh, considering this is all going down to the Plumberg terminals, uh, th that seems, uh, in my opinion, that's a pretty good, uh, you know, handling of write heavy uh, use cases. So, uh, in my opinion, uh, Solar has been handling that pretty well. Uh, I don't really see too many problems. Of course, it can be improved, but uh, it seems to handle write heavy problems pretty well. Okay, thank you, Anshan. So, uh, Joe Christian, is there still a trade-off to be had even with Vespa? Uh, yeah, it's it's a great question because uh, we moved away from uh, the indexing architecture that you see in Elastic and Solar. Um, I think about ten years ago. So we also used to do kind of batch immutable index segments, and you had multiple of them, and you had to. In order to make a document searchable, you have to wait a few seconds and then you build a small index segment, then you flush it and it becomes searchable. And then you have melding in many segments that needs to be merged. And that's what people coming from Elasticsearch to Vespa, they're saying that, so I don't need a heavy RAID array of SSD disks with Vespa. And I think we handle it better than both Elastic and Solar because of our indexing architecture, because we have a mutable memory index uh, in front of the immutable index segment. So we can, we can update uh, the index structures in, in, in real time, instantly in real time. And all the IO operations except read are sequential, right? 
and we choose uh, to parallelize to bring down latency for search. So in Elastic and Solar, you have multiple shards in the node. We instead uh, partition the work uh, of the searcher threads uh, across the document volume. So you don't need to have multiple instances on a single node. So the, the, the right throughput uh, in Vespa, I think, uh, in terms of impacting reads, I think it's better than Solar and, and Elastic. Fantastic. Well, I guess the proof is in the pudding, but it's uh, interesting to oh, hear yeah, sure. different approaches. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> sorry, can I ask you? Especially around the updates, because uh, if you're going to update a searchable field in both Solar and Elastic, uh, you have to read the document and then you have to put it back into the index segment, right? So in Vespa, for our attribute fields uh, that are in memory, we do in place. I know that Solar has in place updates, but they are not searchable. So it means that, you know, what it also, so, so if you're doing these updates that I'm talking about earlier, 50,000 updates per node, it doesn't impact, uh, there's no random access on disk and so on. So, okay. Josh, sorry, you had a, uh, something to add? I just, uh, I have a question for, for Joe Christian. Uh, are, you, are you limited then, you're right throughput limited by the uh, amount of memory that you have? If you're doing everything in memory, do you have, like, is anything flush to disk? Is there yeah. just back so, cache? So, yeah, so, so sorry for interrupting, uh, Josh, I was just eager. So there's, uh, I mean, you can read about this, but we have actually a hybrid combination. So there's a memory index with a fixed size, right? And it's a mutable index structure based on the B, B plus three. So the document gets inserted into this and this is mutable. So you can update the structures, but once the memory index is full, then we flush that in the background and we create a new memory index. And then you, in the background, we use uh, multi, threaded index fusion to, to merge it, but all the IO is sequential. And we use direct IO so that we avoid uh, blowing up the OS buffer cache. So the reads will quickly for the for the physical, the actual disk that is based on the on, on the on the on the disk based index, so that um, the reads are cached in the OS buffer system. So the OS buffer system will take care of whatever memory you have available on the node and we, we can use that for the caching. Fantastic. Exciting stuff. So let's move on to something else, which is certainly in some people's minds looking forward. Um, Peter Dixon Moses has asked a question here about echoing what Joe Christen said about the paradigm shift in search towards machine learning. How did the solar and elastic search roadmaps prioritize ideas like tensor native types, uh, learning to rank and approximate nearest neighbor indexing that Vespa currently supports? So I'm going to pass that on to, to Ansham to first, first uh, answer that one. Yeah, I would uh, be able to go into too many details, but uh, in terms of just prioritizing, solar, uh, solar is completely driven by what, what the users actually want. So if, if at any point in time, someone comes down, uh, one of the users uh, comes over and says, hey, this is something that we want to use, or this is something that's missing in solar, that's how things get prioritized in, in solar in general, uh, this, uh, this thing not excluded. So uh, it's completely driven by, uh, by what, what the users want. Uh, sort of by itself does not really work with, with a roadmap uh, organized by, by a project manager or someone uh, who's, who's tracking the project in terms of what might be needed by users in the future. And uh, I think you're muted, Charlie. I'll learn how to use this one day. Uh, Josh, um, how this is probably one of your favorite subjects. Um, what's the roadmap on on these features for Elasticsearch and how is it prioritized? So I think I think about it in a couple of ways. So one, in terms of prioritization, um, in like we we take not only uh, I want to say influence um, the the needs of our community. We obviously also take in the, to consideration. Um, the the needs of our, our our products and and the customers of those products, so I would say it's it's a hybrid um, where in terms of prioritization that um, you know we're often driving things in both directions where we see customer needs that are uh, you know maybe ahead of the curve of where some of our products are and so we're you know we're obviously interested in uh, taking what the community is doing as state of the art or you know pushing boundaries like we're interested in, in that and we're interested in contributing to that ecosystem as well like we want to be part of that um, 
and in you know in the end what's good for Elasticsearch users like direct Elasticsearch users is good for us as well so um, we we take it as a combination you know there's no there's no saying of like you must do I don't know some uh, paying customer before a, a, a community member like there, there's no prioritization that looks like that um, so I think when it like specifically when it comes to uh, paradigm shift. So this is this is where I work is uh, machine learning and search. Um, so this is something that yeah we're very interested in. I, I think we recognize that we're a little bit behind uh, in that area, and we're we're doing the best we can to to catch up there. Um, I think the great thing about our community is that they they can be ahead of us, and you know we're fully supportive of that. If somebody builds an LTR plugin, uh, you know we can happily suggest that people use that. If people build a K nearest neighbors plugin, we can also happily suggest that people use that. We're also interested, for example, in uh, KNN, we're also interested in the, in the community contribution. So we're trying to uh, uh, develop a, let's say a holistic uh, community that we want to contribute back to Lucene. And we hope that people will contribute to Lucene for the greater good of the whole community uh, of uh, solar as well. So there is work in Lucene right now. I think it's Lucene 9004, if you want to go look up the, the JIRA ticket uh, that introduces the HNSW uh, approximate nearest neighbors. Um, and this will come in Lucene 9, which will eventually come into uh, Elasticsearch as well, you know, as soon as we have Lucene 9. Uh, and we'll be building on top of it, be building the ease of use, the scalability that everyone comes to expect and, and the, the stability that everyone comes to expect from features in Elasticsearch. So, um, you know, we, we have been uh, plugging away at it. Um, it. This is an area that I actively work in. And I think, you know, I can't comment on any roadmaps, but I think I can say in, in the midterm, uh, you will start to see, uh, you'll start to see us bringing out uh, more features in this space, let's say. Fantastic, thank you. And uh, yeah, you can always tell a, a true search hacker if they know Lucene uh, Jira numbers by heart. I think that, that's a particular. That one's point. close to my heart, so I know it. <laughs> um, okay, so um, I'm going to ask us something slightly different here, which is I'm going to ask uh, Joe Christian uh, joins in search engines. Um, certainly, I know in Lucene land there are joins, there are pseudo joins, there are sort of joins, there are cross joins. There's all kind of things that that say they're joins. Not sure any of them are like the join you have in relational database land, but. Um, what do we do about this sort of thing in Vespa? Uh, yeah, so uh, Vespa support, the only join we really support um, in a really scalable way uh, is a parent-child uh, relationship. And for the parent-child relationship, uh, you can, so the parent becomes what we call a global document. So all the documents of this document type is actually distributed across all the nodes in your cluster. So that we, uh, when the child document type needs access to fields that are imported from the parent, uh, that we actually don't have to do any kind of crosswire or something like that, because that will obviously hurt performance. And the fields that you can import uh, into the, um, uh, to, to, to do this kind of join uh, needs to be what we call attribute or in memory fields. So they are in memory at all time. Uh, yeah, so there's, there's some support, but only for the parent child uh, relationship, but you can do uh, if you move because Vespa also comes with the compute engine uh, written in C++, but we also come with what we call a, a stateless container layer, which is written in Java. So when you want to write an end to end application, you, you basically deploy a searcher uh, written in Java and then you can you can do kind of joints on top of with multiple searches, but it's it's not as effective as as the kind of parent child uh, relationship. Okay, yeah. thank you. Oh, and thanks, uh, Prasenjit Senior, for the question. Actually, but um, has anything moved on in joins, Ansham? Ansham, has anything moved on in in the solar world in terms of joins? Uh, well. As you said, there are different kinds of joins. So uh, uh, things like self-join, I was just reading a blog post which you recently, uh, self-join that's used for uh, things like access control, uh, document level access control. Uh, there's uh, there's uh, a ton of optimization um, that uh, improve the performance by an order of magnitude pretty much, maybe even more. 
so things are getting a lot better, again, based on uh, what the users are seeing and what they want to concentrate on. Um, it still comes with its own uh, requirements of having to co-locate uh, data together on the same instance uh, in order to achieve that. But other than that, uh, it, it's been moving, things have been improving, but it's still not there yet. Okay, thank you. So I would just really quickly add, we have something called an enrichment um, processor. So at, at index time, when you're ingesting documents, um, you can you can do a, a lookup on an, another specialized table and easily uh, in, like inject data into your document um, at index time. So that kind of sometimes solves a, a kind of join type of problem, but it's indexing. It's at indexing time. Index side rather than query side. Yeah. Yes, it is. Okay. Um, okay. So thank you very much. Um, so just um, I've got a question here about. Uh, Kubernetes. I mean, Antrim, you've mentioned Kubernetes for uh, Solar and the plugin that um, Bloomberg is contributing back. Um, what's the picture in uh, Elastic Land, Josh, with Kubernetes? So we have a tool, and I always forget the names of things. Um, ECK, I believe it's called. So Elastic. Oh my God, I've probably gotten that wrong. But yes, we do have. Uh, we do have a tool to support uh, deployment into Kubernetes. Um, sorry, busted my headphones at the same time. Um, so we do have a tool to support uh, deployment to Kubernetes. Um, and uh, I believe it's very similar technology to what we use actually internally when we're deploying on the cloud. So you know, you can, you can use it in the cloud, you can use it on-prem, um, but it's there. I believe it's called ECK. And I'm gonna hit myself if I've gotten that wrong. <laughs> yes, that already exists. Fantastic. Joe Christian, what about integration with Vesper and, and uh, good old K8S? Sorry, I, I didn't get the question, sorry. Uh, Kubernetes and Vesper. Yeah, so so uh, you're able to run uh, Vesper on Kubernetes, but it's not, uh, we have chosen a different path for our own cloud offering, but the people ask for it and uh, there's even a documentation page on it, I think. So yeah, it's possible. Yeah, so that's something I didn't know till last week. As he, actually, there's a hosted version of Vespa you're running as a right. service. So um, as many people are these days, it seems, uh, search engines as a service. So um, what else have we got in our questions? Thank you all for posting your questions. I'm, I'm really trying to get to them in, uh, in, in a sensible order. And uh, uh, Charlie, I'd like to just add sure. a bit about servers, just I can call it a plug even. Uh, Solar, uh, the, the Kubernetes operator for Solar uh, is, is in my opinion, pretty game changing, especially because it will allow people to uh, kind of converge on the best practices of deploying Solar and Kubernetes. And so far people had been having their own scripts or, whatever, or in whichever way they were deploying stuff. Uh, but going forward, coming out of the Apache umbrella, it'll just be uh, converged best practices all being offered that will allow people to do things like rolling restarts uh, without having to bother about how to what's the right way to go about and do that or how to handle that. So um, that's that's a big effort and that's a that's a pretty critical one uh, in my opinion in terms of solar operations on Kubernetes. Okay, fantastic. Thank you. Uh, let's have a look. Um, Lots of questions on Vespa today. So you're, you're popular here, Joe Christian. And um, I will just uh, add a quick plug here. Joe Christian does hang out in our relevant Slack channel. So, and I'm absolutely sure that if you've got these questions, you don't get a chance to ask them today. If you've got questions in the future, jump into relevant Slack. The link will be at the end uh, of this, or you can join from our, the OIC website. And I'm sure he'll do his best to answer you there. Um, <clears throat> so uh, Alexander asks, does Elastic or Solar support in-place updates at least in some simpler situations, e.g. numeric fields. Antrim, do you want to answer that one? Sorry, uh, can you repeat that question for me? Does, uh, does Solar support in-place updates, at least in some simpler situations, e.g. numeric fields? Uh, for doc values, yes. Uh, that's the only place we support in-place updates. Uh, nothing else, in my opinion, can be updated uh, in place. Uh, that's a restriction on just how things are architected in the sort of the scene world. Uh, it's just non trivial to do so. Okay, Josh, and I guess the same situation really for Elasticsearch. As, yeah, as far as I, as far as I know, it's, it's the same situation, yeah. 
Okay, fantastic. Um, and there's a, a question here for, uh, for Joe Christian. Um, so where is it? Uh, face, I don't know how you pronounce that. Uh, it's the Facebook, Facebook library, I believe. Um, Facebook something search something. Uh, how does Facebook compare to it? Are you familiar with that? Thank you, um, Christopher, for the question. Yeah, so it's, it's a great question. Uh, so I'm familiar with uh, FICE and uh, other uh, libraries for doing uh, KNN uh, or approximate nearest neighbor search. Uh, I think FICE, they also use the same uh, HNSW, hierarchical navigable small world graph, uh, like we do. Um, but FICE can only do nearest neighbor search and they return the ID uh, of the vector. So you get top 10 nearest neighbors or approximate nearest neighbors. It's very fast and so on. Um, but in Vespa, you can actually combine the, the nearest neighbor search with uh, query filters. And it's not like in uh, the KNN plugin for um, Elastic Open Distro, which does kind of a post-processing step uh, after you have retrieved the nearest neighbor vectors. So if you have a restrictive filter, let's say I want to only uh, have articles from uh, last day and you have a month of data, uh, the nearest neighbors uh, for your search query. And if you apply that filter, <clears throat> then you might end up with zero documents after you have done uh, the filtering part. So that's the true unique thing about our implementation of approximate nearest neighbor search is that we combined the search for the nearest neighbor with the filters. And the way we do this is that we actually, Web, Vespa has a, a nice feature because all these three engines, they use document at a time query evaluation, but Vespa has actually this hybrid evaluation where we detect that certain parts of the query tree can actually be evaluated using something we call a term at a time, which is much more efficient, much more cash friendly and so on. So we can evaluate parts of the query uh, so that we know which part of this document collection is actually matching the filter. And then we go uh, searching for the nearest neighbors. So, but including the filtering uh, makes the ANN a little bit slower, but uh, the value it adds uh, to actually constrain the search in nearest neighbor search uh, by this filter, I think, um, uh, it's so beneficial that uh, that small performance penalty is acceptable. Yeah. So yeah, we, we compare with, with FICE and, and so on. If you compare kind of the raw performance of a library, uh, we are, our APIs are HTTP and so on. So you will find that uh, Vespa will be slower than FICE uh, when you use FICE as a library. And also FICE is just a library it doesn't have the kind of distribution mechanisms that we have uh, to scale the cluster across multiple nodes. And, and you cannot do other important thing is the real time because we do support adding new vectors in, in real time into, into the data store. Uh, FICE is kind of batch oriented. Yeah, so that's, that's the differences between FICE and the Vespa ANN implementation. Okay. <laughs> Sorry. Awesome. Yeah, great, great question. Good stuff. Well, um, I mean, while you're on here, uh, Joe Christian, I'm going to ask a, a question that was uh, inspired here by, uh, uh, let me just see who asked this question. Uh, yes, uh, Rene asked, um, is Vespa in, is learning anything from Elastic and Solar? Yes, of course. Like I said, uh, I mean, both, um, I mean, both are great engines and uh, you can build a terrible search experience with them, all of them, right? All, <laughs> if, you, if you want to. Uh, but I think that the, the toolbox in, in Vespa is bigger. But yes, we learn a lot on Elastic and how they became popular. Uh, developer friendliness, nice APIs. Uh, they have great support for doing analytics. Uh, they are great for handling immutable data. So data like logs that never changes. Uh, Solar um, and Lucene, obviously, we, we learn from, from Lucene and I mean, it has a, a huge crowd of developers working on search for 20 years, right? Um, 
So there's things to learn from Lucene. Uh, if you look at Solar, I think that in terms of search and relevancy and so on, I think that Solar is our biggest uh, competitor because a lot of the big companies that are doing uh, things around search and search relevance, I think uh, a lot of them are using actually Solar, yeah. <clears throat> yeah. I'll turn this question back to Anshan. Do you think there's anything that uh, the world of solar can learn from Vespa? Uh, absolutely. Uh, there's, uh, there's use cases that we haven't ever thought about. Uh, there, there are problems that we, we uh, solar has been an old project. So uh, we've kind of lived in a silo, I would say for the most part of it, or not, not for the most part of it, but for a reasonable bit of it. And so learning from Vespa around all the, or, uh, around all the machine learning stuff would be, would be a great boon, especially because we haven't concentrated too much on, on that aspect other than a few people uh, who needed that, uh, that feature support. Um, so that would be that would be a big win. Uh, Vespa does come with a lot of experience. Um, it is pretty much up there with Lucina Solar in terms of how old the project's been, maybe older, and uh, the experience that comes with Vespa. And I'm sure has been incorporated in the in the engine itself. So yes, there's there's a ton of uh, of things we look forward to learning from Vespa. Um, I would, I would like to uh, add on though, uh, we've already learned that feel uh, a ton of things from Elastic and uh, the, the evolution of solar from being harder, comparatively more difficult to use uh, to becoming relatively easier to use uh, has come from when Elastic came out and became, it was uh, kind of the cool kid on the blocks, like easy to run, developers loved it. Um, and that's when we were like, okay, well, we were living in a, under a silo of like, uh, solar has no problems. It's an amazing search pro uh, solution. People love it. Uh, but what we did not realize were people were having terrible time using it. And so we learned a lot from Elastic on that front. Uh, better documentation, cleaner APIs, uh, just having to think about it. I'm not saying we've solved that problem, but just that uh, that problem needs to be addressed. and. Elastic addressed it, and we see the benefits that Elastic gets from it. So yeah, we, we've been learning from everyone we can. Charlie, unmute it. Josh, as one of the uh, aforementioned cool kids in the block, uh, have, uh, has Elastic uh, learned anything from Vespa? Do you see that happening in the future? Uh, I guess I would first say my 13-year-old self is now super proud to be working for one of the cool kids. Um, <laughs> but yeah, I mean, uh, Elastic, I think, looks to uh, the community and new competitors like Vespa um, to understand uh, what is missing in Elasticsearch. We're not everything to everybody. We know that. Um, and, you know, we're interested in continuing to grow. So seeing um, the types of, I would say, bleeding edge uh, search experiences that you can build with Vespa uh, more easily than you can build an elastic search, I think is super inspiring. And we're, we're definitely looking at this and looking at uh, what's going on in, in the research community uh, and act actively trying to contribute to the research community as well to understand um, what is going on on this, I, I would call bleeding edge uh, of search and what's going on in the, um, in the enterprise, like what's going on with our the rest of our community and our customers? Are people asking for the bleeding edge? Are they ready for the bleeding edge? Are we ready to give them the bleeding edge? And I think this is a huge open question right now that a lot of this stuff is, ex is extremely new. We don't yet see a ton of patterns for how to apply these things to particular use cases. Um, and I think it's gonna be, you know, there it is this paradigm shift. It's true, I, I agree with this. And I think the big question is how can we make this applicable and useful and usable um, by the masses effectively? We're not web scale. A lot of our, our users are not building web scale search products, right? They're building FAQ sites and they're building, you know, search over 50,000 documents that don't change very often. Like this is the bread and butter of what a lot of users are doing and they want to be able to do that well and they want to be able to do it easily. So. I would say, yes, we're extremely inspired by the stuff happening in, in the research community and how Vespa is able to, to take advantage of their, uh, of this, of this research. I think we're very, we want to be very thoughtful about how to bring this to the, the community and how to bring this to our customers in a very 
um, yeah, well supported and and easy to use, easy to use fashion. So fantastic. And yeah, collaboration is the way forward, of course. Inspiration and getting more documents and things written out there to explain how to handle different situations. I'd absolutely support that. The more information on how somebody else has done something there is, the easier your life becomes. Um, so here's an interesting question. Um, uh, Gui Zhao uh, says they remember that FICE uh, supports indexing and searching with GPUs. Uh, GPU uh, powered indexing searching. Is that is there any possibility to do that with Vespa, Elasticsearch, or or Solar? I'm going to ask Joe Christian. Yeah, so uh, this is something we are actively. So currently, Vespa is CPU only. Uh, we are actively looking at uh, using GPU for evaluating uh, because we see that. We get larger and larger and larger pre-trained language models, and some of them are too large to be able to run uh, at scale um, on a CPU. No chance. Uh, so we are looking at that. We are at, there is a GitHub issue on it, so we're looking at it. Uh, but we also recognize that um, not a lot of organizations have a lot of powerful GPUs. I mean, if you're Google, Twitter, etc., yes, sure, uh, you have clouds of GPUs and you can use it both for indexing. I think on the indexing side, actually, it's easier, but to actually use GPUs inside Vespa for serving, um, for actual search serving, uh, yes, it's something we're looking at. But um, for right now, we're trying to find uh, models which uh, runs efficiently on the CPU. And there's a lot of development there as well because Vespa is, is written in C++. So we make use of uh, open blasts and, and libraries to optimize, to get the most out of the CPUs, to use um, special instructions and so on to, to kind of get most out of the CPUs, yeah. Okay. Ansham, is there any plans you know of for Lucene or Solar to support GPUs as a workhorse? Yeah, uh, I guess about two and a half years ago, there was a there was a discussion in the community, and and the Jira was opened uh, with an intention to pro possibly get a uh, get a GSOC co uh, candidate to start looking at that. Uh, and since I've, uh, I I know Ishan for sure, and then other people in the community have also thought about exploring that possibility. It's just been a lack of bandwidth, but the idea is to see if any other indexing or search capabilities from Lucene could be offloaded to kind of uh, tapping into the power uh, or compute power offered by, by GPUs. Uh, so that's still an open thing, but it's, it's certainly out there, something that's been discussed in the past and hopefully we can get to it uh, sometime in the near future. Fantastic. And Josh, I guess that that leads on to, I guess anything that's supported Lucene that Elasticsearch can take advantage of is great, but is there any, uh, any parallel work going on perhaps in machine learning? So uh, yes, on the machine learning side, we are interested as well in um, GPU support. Um, it's again, something we're talking about. We, we know we're gonna have to get there at some point. It's not on the roadmap. Um, so I couldn't even put a pin on it. Uh, but yeah, it's, it's definitely a topic, you know, for all the reasons Joe Christian mentioned um you know we know performance uh inference performance on uh large pre-trained language models it can be quite slow uh, and again this is part of our thought process of like it's got to be scalable it's got to be usable so we we will get there uh, but it's not on the roadmap yet fantastic so early days i think that's the summary from everyone's early days yet sounds cool but it doesn't work yet um so there's another question here from uh, again a more n um Given large language model dominance in five years, so looking a little further ahead, um, how much do we need to support manual relevance tuning? Is it, are our search engines just going to be doing the, that initial retrieval step and then everything's going off to Bert and, so, and whatever son of or grandson of Bert is uh, to do the heavy lifting? What do we think about that one, Joe Christian? Yeah, I want to answer that. So it's a great question. So Bert or pre-trained language models helps the machine actually understand text better than we could before, right? So, and it has shown dramatic progress on ranking, right? but on the relevancy data sets, it's basically only about the text ranking. So there's no doubt that the pre-trained language models understands text better than before, right? And that they have transformed search and they are 100% better than BM25. 
But a lot of search solutions around there is not only about um, how relevant the text is for the query. There are multiple things in play, right? So there might be things like uh, click models, um, popularity of the site. So even if the if, even if the text is in the same score range, it might be that you want to prefer uh, a more popular site and so on. So, and that's the thing. Our idea was that we need to be able to do ranking with BERT locally on each of the content nodes, because as I said in my pitch. Then we can combine uh, the scoring from the language model into kind of a normal learning to rank framework. So we can take into account the quality and click model from our tensors and so on. So no, I don't think that you will, uh, five years down the line, you will see that you use uh, some kind of sparse retrieval and then retrieve uh, a thousand documents and then run them to BERT inference and so on. And then it's slow as well. Yeah. Thank you. So. Uh... Anshun, do you think Bert's going to eat the world, or we're still going to need good old search? Uh, I, uh, I I strongly think uh, we'll still need uh, manual tuning of relevance. Uh, five years uh, is is too soon, in my opinion, and we're still, uh, for all the reasons uh, already mentioned, uh, we'll still need manual tuning uh, of search, uh, and it'll be a little while before. Uh, I, I'm not sure if we even want to get there. But if we do get there, it certainly happen oh, after the five years, uh, not so soon. Josh, do you agree? Yeah, I mean, I, I would definitely, I was nodding my head very voraciously at everything Joe Christian was, was saying, because we see it, I mean, we see it the same way. And I think one of the things that um, is often forgotten is um, BERT as a language model in, in ranking really only works when you've fine-tuned it uh, on your ranking problem. Like you can't just take Bert, Bert out of the box and plug it in and suddenly your ranking gets better, actually it gets worse. So it's, you know, so you're gonna need data sets to be able to do that as well. And, you know, the hope is that you don't need hundreds of thousands uh, of labeled examples or um, uh, like a ranked relevance data set that's really huge. Maybe you only need 2000 examples or 3000 examples. You know, hopefully we can get that number down and down um, with fine, -tune, uh, fine tuning. Um, but it is really important to remember that you, for ranking, you still need to fine tune uh, BERT for the ranking problem itself. You can't just use BERT out of the box. Yeah, I, I really would like to add to this because uh, I get these emails from Medium uh, about using BERT for ranking. And then I see people using things like BERT as a service, which basically uses just the pre-trained model and just using this as an embedding or representation model. And it hasn't been tuned at all for the ranking task. And then they write a nice medium blog post on this and they put it into the dense vector field of Elastic. And then they say, hey, look, I have some semantic search and it's, it's great. But in reality, if you use BERT in this way, um, you get basically next to random results. So the resources at, at Microsoft, they tried this and they are at the, at the bottom of the MS Marco passage ranking with a very low score. So, so when people come to you and say that, hey, we, we, we're gonna use BERT for ranking, you know, be careful because it, 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 the, the, there are ways to use BERT that is simply giving you random ranking. Um, uh, but on what Joss is saying on the training, I think that we see that these pre-trained language models, if you have fine-tuned them uh, on this data, uh, and if you try to apply them to a different domain, they actually have quite good, uh, what we call zero-shot uh, transfer capabilities. So they outperform the traditional uh, BM25 and so on on another data set as well. And that's something we actively at the Vespa team um, are investigating if we can actually help uh, with pre-trained models to say that you can use this model. And if you have gone through a thing like a relevancy training, Charlie, that you have, and you have your metrics, you can basically evaluate with what you have today and if it's gonna improve. I mean, if you don't have the kind of uh, relevancy or data set internally, you know, you cannot uh, plug in anything or do change it to your ranking because you don't know if it's improving or getting worse, right? Yeah, so, I certainly agree with that one. If you can't yeah. measure how good or bad your search is, how can exactly. you possibly improve it? So um, we've got a question. Um, I'm going to come back to you, Joe Christian, with, with um, maybe a, a slightly different line of questioning here, which is uh, people have asked 
a bit more about the history and usage of Vesper. I mean, it sounds really cool. The question is, is anyone using it apart from Horizon? And somebody's actually asked, is there a large e-commerce shop using Vespa in production? Are there people, you know, who's actually running the uh, uh, Vespa cloud? Um, I think that's the nervousness people have when they hear about something that sounds brilliant, but it's whether yeah. it's, it's being yeah, yeah. used by anyone else. Okay, so um, the, the Vespa cloud offering, the cloud Vespa.ai, that is run by Verizon Media, uh, the company that I work for. And uh, are other companies using Vespa outside of Verizon Media? Yes. Um, there is actually a lot uh, that is using it. And also, if you go to shoppingyahoo.com, uh, which is an e commerce search site, they're using Vespa. Um, and we use it at scale in Verizon Media for. Uh, all our search properties, but also for recommending ads on the Yahoo homepage, on the finance homepage, on the sports homepage, and also the entire Gemini native ad serving stack is built on Vespa. So we recommend ads uh, using Vespa. So it's heavily um, a user of our partial updates because <clears throat> one use case of doing partial updates is to update the document uh, if they go out of budget. Uh, so it's very important for us to not serve uh, ads that are out of budget. Uh, other use cases, all our other customers, uh, you have, um, yeah, th there's a lot actually, but uh, one issue is that some of them, they don't want to come forward and talk really public about it, right? So, so there's, uh, and I don't know how many names I can, I can drop, but uh, some of the largest social media sites in the world is using Vespa, if, if I can say that, so... Okay, so so there's, there, there are people using it, but data is unclear in terms of who these people are at the moment. Yeah, I mean, for the people that are onboarding our Vespa Cloud, it's, I mean, they don't want to talk about uh, what technology they're using. And some of them, honestly, uh, they don't want to, if we ask them, you know, could you maybe, you have a really interesting use case. So we had one user coming in and he said that, and he had a lot of hardware a very powerful hardware uh, had 16 or 16 billion documents, advanced ranking, and so on. And he was like wondering, you know, this is a company with a lot of resources. And he's like, can we ask you to come forward and so we can maybe use it in some way? And they were like, no, sorry, you know, I, I can't talk about it. So we, <laughs> so yeah, so so I don't have a huge uh, name list to to drop. Uh, there was a question on the background of Vespa. Uh, I, I briefly touched on this, but uh, the background of Vespa is actually from uh, a company called Fast Search and Transfer, uh, which was founded here in Trondheim in 1997 uh, at the university here, or springing out of the university here in Trondheim. And back then we used to try to compete with Google with our AlderWeb.com search engine. And uh, both AlderWeb and uh, AltaVista were uh, sold to Overture. And then a few months later, Yahoo bought Overture and Yahoo also bought Inktomi. And then there were like three different web search technologies coming into Yahoo. And uh, they asked us to solve vertical search and recommendation. So that's the kind of background of, of Vespa where we're coming from. Okay. Yeah. Okay, I, I hope I, I got everything. Yes, I think so. Um, and I, I really, I think I for, for, for the community on. part, this is something you know, we really would like people to talk more about their Vespa usage and so on. But okay. Well, that leads on to the next, yeah, the next question I've got, um, actually, and I'm gonna, I'm gonna push this out to to Anshu and Josh first. Um, I mean, community is really important, and Max has asked, uh, what are the plans for growing your communities, and where should we go to ask questions, have discussions, you know, continue these conversations? Because I think these are really valuable for those of us continue, you know, considering which search engines. So, um, Anshu, what are the plans for growing the the solar community? Great question. Uh, we, uh, at least the current active members of the community, kind of realize the importance of engaging with uh, with newer members, and like most importantly, uh, but also continuing the the older conversations going, um, so that people come in and start talking about stuff, motivating people to talk about their current use cases and share uh, at least their needs and stuff and. Um, one of the things that we did was to include, uh, move to newer technologies like GitHub, uh, 
and make it more user friendly. Uh, we've started to kind of tag issues again to, to have our developer community engage with us more actively. Um, but overall, we just, we've just been trying harder to engage and um, you know, motivate people to participate in our, in our discussions, to keep things uh, friendly, nice and civil, uh, to get people to participate and talk about their use cases. So that's, that's pretty much what we've been trying to do. And we, we feel like people are gonna come in first as users and then stay being developers when they need more from the project. And that's the right way to grow uh, the community organically rather than just find a developer who's never looked at the project or used it and then uh, you know, start writing code and submitting patches. Like the, the organic way in our opinion, or at least in my opinion, is to have people come uh, be a part of the community and then become a developer over a due course of time based on just their need. Thank you. And I guess the, the, the thing about solar, of course, is there's no one company controlling it. So yes. uh, it's a collective effort and, and one would hope that those companies who benefit from the use of solar would put some of that love back. I and mean, it's something that uh, Bloomberg have certainly done. They've contributed hugely to the uh, solar community and sponsoring events and running things like that. So what about this, Josh? What, what are Elastic's plans for growing the Elastic Search community? Um, so we have a lot of plans. Community is really at like the core of, of a lot of what we do. So like we have dedicated community team. Um, we have actually a community conference uh, coming up in uh, a month time. Uh, and I see there's 1200 people registered right now. Um, so that's a global community event where people get to talk about, they can register and talk about um, their own use cases. You can join and just listen, uh, that's fine as well. Um, we also hosted a lot of Elasticon uh, conferences um, that cover a lot of different aspects of the whole um, offer, all the offerings of Elastic. Um, I would say like to Max's question in particular, um, I, I think there's a, there's a few different kinds of users, I guess I would think about it. It's like people that are contributing back that are developers that like want to get into the weeds uh, of Lucene and Elasticsearch. Um, GitHub is probably the, the place to go. You know, it's from day one, we've been you know all on GitHub. Um, so I'd say if, if you're interested in, in making contributions, GitHub is definitely the place to go. And it's just Elastic slash Elasticsearch or Kibana or whatever you're interested in. Um, of course, there's our discuss forum, which is huge. You can ask a ton of questions. You probably already got you know an answer to your question if you look at uh, discuss.elastic.co. Um, and you can also just look for uh, community events that are being local, locally organized. Um, we have community.elastic.co. Um, you can sign up for newsletters to see uh, where people are talking about um, Elasticsearch uh, all around the world. They used to be in person, obviously, they're gonna be a lot of virtual events, um, but it's it, like, it's a continuing ongoing thing for us. Community never stops. We never stop trying to grow our community. Um, so I'd say that, I, I don't know if there's any like really specific things. I'm sure the community team would have something to say about it, um, but it's like continued engagement, you know, and it's, it's tried to have all of these events. It's tried to make, um, uh, it's trying to make these uh, uh, connections between uh, people to help each other as well. Um, so, you know, maybe you meet somebody at one of these meetups that can help you with a problem that you just never thought of or inspires you um, with a, a particular uh, approach, you know, and that's, it's super important for us to be able to have that community sort of have some synergy within the community and have these, uh, these moments of serendipity. Um, so yeah, we try through all those methods to encourage community. Fantastic. Thank you. And we're going to have to mention uh, that there is the possibility of a parallel community. Um, as people know, um, Amazon have announced, Amazon and Logs.io, uh, some others have announced that there may be a, a different version of something like Elasticsearch coming about, about soon, whether it's going to be called Elasticsearch or not is, I think, a very open question. But there may well be a parallel community around that, um, focusing on the non-elastic Elasticsearch, whatever that is. So there, there are going to be many here. Um, Joe Christian, what about... Um, Vespa, because you know, in a way, although you're a, 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 a very venerable technology, you're a, the new kid in the block when it comes to community. What are your plans for growing the Vespa community? Yeah, I think uh, uh, we underestimated how much effort it takes to build a community when we open sourced in 2017. Um, 
so we tried to we learned from elastic we wanted to to have vespa to be easy to be to how to use vespa and uh, to get started with vespa so we thought okay the way we're going to scale is to have stellar documentation the documentation needs to be stellar uh, it needs to be you get a great start uh, but the community around it getting help from others that are using vespa i don't think we haven't been that successful uh, at building that um, honestly uh, but the way to reach out to us we we have a tag on, on stack overflow uh, we also have a channel on something called gitter uh, we're thinking about opening a, a slack space uh, a dedicated slack space uh, we also have a, a vespa channel in in your slack space um, charlie so questions and are, are, are open uh, open there and to ask me anything but uh, we haven't really seen the community kicking off. So uh, we have been dreaming of having, uh, we've done like internal Vespa conferences inside Verizon Media, like a three day trip to Taipei and bringing all the people using Vespa around the world to this kind of semi Vespa icon. And uh, our dream is to have something similar to that to ElasticCon, I mean, so. But also Elastic have a larger budget around the, the community building part, right? They have a, a lot of people, like 700 people. And I think they have a marketing department and they have some own community and, and they encourage people to write blog posts and, and help out there and so on. We don't, we don't have that yet. I'm yeah. sorry, I would just add, we, we didn't always have that. And certainly when we started out, you know, oh. I, I, I remember that when they started that if you joined Elastic, the company, yeah. Like that was your job. Your job was to be a community advocate. Your job was to go to customers and do customer support. Like you did everything. And that's, you know, a lot of the original, like early uh, employees, that's, that was part of the job. They spent a lot of time on site at customers and doing community advocacy. So, so uh, as one, you do. Yeah. So, so one thing we're actually trying, because I mean, the, we have a core Vespa team, right? And then there's the extended team that's actually working on Vespa on various parts, like taking it into uh, production. Uh, the extended team is like 300 people. So what we're doing is like asking them, you know, can you document how you're using Vespa for local search? Can you document how you use Vespa for streaming search? How do you do it for recommending articles on the homepage? How do you do it to scale personalized search, uh, like uh, email search and so on? How do you, like, there's, there's like 150 different use cases around inside the company, right? So we are asking people, you know, to, 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 write small blog posts on, on their use cases, you know, so that we can show actually uh, the depth and the, and, the, and the wideness of things that you can do with Vespa, right? So some of the use cases around inside the company, they're not even about search, right? They're about recommendations. Some of them are using Vespa just like a brute force tensor evaluation engine. Right? So that's one thing that we are concretely uh, looking at, you know, to, to scale the kind of, uh, to people can learn about what you can use Vespa for and so on. But, yeah, it's interesting. Yeah, uh, but I'd, I'd like to add. Uh, I'd like to add one thing. Uh, solar uh, certainly doesn't come from. Uh, so it's not really supported by a company being in a project project, uh, and that's where I feel like people like Charlie and Open Source Connections uh, come in and do their role of of being the community. So we didn't really. Uh, Put in the money there, but it was the community that kind of just worked harder to grow itself organically. Uh, so yeah, thanks to Charlie and everyone else who's just been a part of the community and been uh, kind of involved in growing the community uh, for solar at least. So even without the uh, a ton of money going in, uh, just it's just been the community that's been kind of self-sustaining and growing. Thank you, and I, I think this is. I mean, this is the point. Um, to grow a community, you do need. Um, investment from somewhere, be it from users, be it in case of time or money or personal effort. Um, and it's a long road. It takes a, a while to do and a while to build it, but it's a very powerful thing to build up that user community and it helps drive things forward. So um, we're beginning to come towards the end of our, our, our time here. So I really wanted to get into some, maybe some closing words from each of our speakers today. Um, if there's Okay, three things. I'm gonna ask you for three things that would make you recommend the search engine you're a, a champion of um, over the other two here. And I also know you're all lovely people and you're being far too polite about everybody else. 
Um, but uh, three things that might uh, you might use to push your uh, your uh, your search engine over the other one. I'm going to ask Josh to kick us off. Um, I mean, I think I would reiterate what I said in the intro. The the first one to me, and like what we just talked about, the first one to me is the the ecosystem, the community being a big part of it. And I, you know, I don't think I, I don't need to rehash what we've already talked about. But I'd, I'd go with number one is ecosystem. Uh, it's probably the biggest one for us. Um, I'd say um, the second one is probably ease in terms of getting started, operations, um, yeah, all of the rest. Uh, and I'd say, uh, oh, this is so hard. Uh, there's so many things I could choose. Um, uh, I'd say like for today's customer, I would say um, like, cloud readiness, you know, whether you roll it yourself, you run on-prem, big cluster, small cluster, you use our cloud service, like we cover the gamut of um, deployment models, like how do you want to deploy architecture types? I'd say the, those would be my top three. That was really hard though. <laughs> Sorry to call on you first. Well, somebody who's had a little more time to think is Joe Christian. What are your, your top three reasons for Vespa? Yeah, I, I coming back to the pitch I made, I mean, Vespa has, a great toolbox for doing modern search, modern retrieval. And uh, we integrate with a lot of machine learning models. So if you want to have kind of state of the art uh, retrieval and ranking, Vespa is really a good choice. And secondly, our indexing architecture, which allows you to do true partial updates uh, at scale and also high indexing volume is another very nice feature because if you combine those two the real-time feeding and the actual all the machine learning models you basically have models that are updated in real time because the data changes all the time so you can make decisions in, in real time based on updated information so that's two and i think the third is uh, scalability and uh, a true elastic content cluster that you don't have to uh, predetermine the number of shards that you're going to end, end up with and so that you can actually grow from one node into 100 nodes um, without having to do anything else than adding the, the node to the cluster. And also scale, scalability. Uh, maybe it's a fourth point, but yeah, I'll keep it with that. That's the three points from me. Fantastic. And yeah. I could, I could see you uh, frantically uh, scribbling something. What's your, what's your top yeah. three points to recommend, Sala? Um, well, the first one is uh, it's, it's been tested. Uh, for different use cases by different companies at large scale and small both. Um, so that along with the ease of operation with the introduction of things like the solar operator uh, will just make it an easy and reliable way for people to have search uh, supported for whatever their use case may be. Um, that's, that's one. Uh, the second is just the architecture itself uh, being pluggable by design. Uh, so that uh, that kind of plays in with uh, with how the project was envisioned. Of uh, it's an open source project where people can go in and plug whatever they want uh, into it. So the pluggability allows for people to use custom, uh, you know, security plugins or whatever they need uh, for their own specific use cases that are not necessarily open sourceable, uh, if that's a word. Uh, but um, so that's the second. And the third, and in my opinion, like the most important one is that it's, a, it's an Apache project at the end of the day. Uh, the reason why uh, foundations like Apache exist is to ensure uh, neutrality, uh, to ensure uh, the community owns uh, what they own. Um, and then there's no vendor lock-in or there's no one person owning uh, the entire project or driving the entire project, which is good and bad. But in my opinion, it's more good than bad because yes, the APIs are not as clean, but at the end of the day, uh, you can rely upon the project being there as long as you want to maintain it. So yeah, those, uh, those are the three uh, things. Fantastic. Thank you so much to all three of our speakers today. Um, I think you'll all agree that's been fascinating stuff. Um, as I said, uh, the talk's going to be recorded and it will be on uh, our YouTube channel very soon. Um, so uh, Joe Christian from uh, Verizon and Vespa, uh, Josh from Elastic, 
and Elasticsearch and Antrim from Apple and the Lucene PMC and Solar. Thank you very much. Um, just to like have a couple of, let's have a look at this. Um, follow up talks. Um, as I say, the talk will be on our YouTube channel very soon. Um, so keep an eye on that. I'll drop a link into the meetup um, message board if you can't find the link from our website. Uh, if you'd like to join uh, Ansham, Josh, Joe Christian, and about over 1,200 other search people, come and join Relevant Slack. The link is down the bottom there. Or also you can join from our website. It's, it's a great place for peer support for us all to chat about the subjects we love. Um, now, where there will be a, another Haystack Live talk. Uh, Deepak Palmer from Shipt is going to be speaking on February the 18th on search relevance engineering query understanding and ranking, which sounds fascinating. So do uh, publicize that. And we are looking for more speakers. So if you have got a talk on search and relevance, please go to the Haystack website. That's haystackconf.com. That's on the bottom there. And on the right hand side, you'll find a submission link for submitting your talk. And we'll try and get it live soon. We're running these about every three or four weeks if we can. We are beginning to think about a possible physical Haystack conference sometime later this year. That is all I'm going to say on the subject. No promises. Obviously, the world is crazy at the moment, uh, but we really do look forward to seeing you all in person soon. Um, so news will be publicized about that as soon as we know it. But please don't book anything, plan anything yet. If anything's, we've learned anything from the last year is planning is, is a crazy idea sometimes. Uh, I do encourage you to check out um, OSC's future training opportunities. And we actually have a ticket for our solar training next week, which has become available on very short notice. So if you're interested, do check that out. Otherwise, we have training running in April and May. Um, and I think that's about it. So uh, I wish you all the best to everyone who's turned up today. Thank you all for coming. Um, and we will see you all again soon back at Haystack Live. I'm Charlie Hull from Open Source Connections. If you need help with your search, get in touch. Take care. Thanks, everyone. Bye-bye.